Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you. All blessed audiences, next is opening remarks from the head of Center for Research and Society Engagement, University of Jember, who will also open the sharing session. To Professor Dr. Yuli Vitano MP, time is yours. Yeah. Thank you, the Master of Ceremony, Ibu Enda. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good morning, yeah. Our honored speakers, Professor Andreas Sunjak, yeah, Professor in Digital Business and Strategics, Innovation Management University of Applied Sciences of Lansburg. Thank you for your coming here yeah, in uh, University of Jember, especially in Center of uh, Research Institute and uh, Community Service. And also our uh, and speakers, yeah. Ibu Siti Masrifatul Fitriya, PhD from Faculty of Teaching and Education uh, Science, uh, University of Jember, and also the church, uh, Bapak Arizal Mujib Tamala Nanda Imran, yeah, from Faculty of Engineering, yeah, the University of Jember, and also the Secretary uh, of LP2AM, Center of Research, Academic and Community Service, yeah, Bapak Rondi, PhD. And Ibu Kartika, for Dr. Kartika, yeah, uh, coordinator of uh, research, uh, research development, yeah, uh, LP2M, yeah, and also the team, yeah, and professors, maybe, yeah, lecturers, and also our student, many students come here, yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, uh, present boots, yeah, online or uh, and on offline, I respect. First of all, uh, let us praise and thank uh, the presence of Allah Almighty for the abundance of grace and joy that all of us can still gather in this meeting without any barrier at all and in good health. In uh, on this occasion. Allow me to welcome the joining of the sharing session by our one speaker from Germany and two speakers from the University of Jember. They will share their knowledge and experiences about how to foster a modern and contemporary startup culture in a university or research environment. Basically, startup companies are synonym synonyms uh, with those uh, using the internet and technology. Startups aim to fix existing products, deficiencies, or create entirely new products. On the other hand, university, especially the University of Jember, have produced many research products through scientific publication, uh, prototype, uh, patent, or uh, intellectual property rights, uh, however, translating scientific work into implementation language yeah, or implementation level, uh, especially in business activities, is not easy. Yeah. Therefore, this morning discussion will be critical and ex exciting for everyone who joins. By saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I officially open this sharing session. Welcome to follow and enjoy sharing session this morning. I hope you all are healthy and properly and this session will be useful. Congratulations on performing worship during Ramadan. We apologize for any mistakes. Hopefully increase the degree of our faith. Thank you and have a good morning. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Yuli, for the speech. Dear distinguished guests, the next agenda is the main agenda that we are waiting for, the sharing session, that will be moderated by Al-Hanif M.A. LLM PhD. Al-Hanif M.A. LLM PhD is a lecturer from Faculty of Law, University of Jember. 
He received his PhD in law from School of Oriental and Africa African Studies University of London. He was appointed as a chairperson of the Indonesian Consortium for Human Rights Lecturers Indonesia since 2017 until 2019. Currently, he is the director of the Center for Human Rights, Multiculturalism, and Migration University of Jember. Pak Hani, the floor is yours. Uh, test, test, test. Test, test, test. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my great pleasure to chair this session. Uh, there are two things that I forgot this morning. Actually, I had a class at uh, seven, so that's why I'm late. And the second one, actually, I forgot this uh, this event today. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, now, at the same time, uh, there was um, a registration for the uh, new bank account uh, for the members of uh, Faculty of Law from nine to eleven. So of course, I will miss this uh, event in Faculty of Law. So I will not uh, have a new bank account for our Raymond, yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the point is money, yes. <laughs> okay. okay, I apologize for these uh, uh, three things. Uh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to have two or three hours uh, session. I, I hope it will be really fruitful for us uh, because it is quite new for me. Uh, I'm a legal scholar. Now I want to share about... Uh, uh, contemporary state are decolonizing uh, English uh, through culture and also teaching factory program. So this, uh, these three things um, uh, really aligns to my uh, expertise. Yeah. So I hope um, during my uh, chair in running this session, uh, everyone will be actively engaged. Uh, if you want to, I hope uh, you will have some uh, good questions uh, raised to Professor Andreas Rusnyak. I hope I will not uh, misspell your name. And also uh, Dr. Uh, Siti Masri Fatul Fitria from the Faculty of Teacher and Training. And uh, the third speaker, the second speaker is Mas Arizal Mujib Tamala Nanda Imron from Faculty of Engineering. So these three uh, speakers are two speakers and then will be followed by uh, input session by Professor Andreas. We'll be talking about uh, something about culture, changing culture, decolonializing English. So I have to be really careful. Yeah? Uh, and also about teaching factory programs. So I really don't know about these two, uh, two uh, themes, topics. Yeah? So without further ado, so I will give the first uh, time for Dr. Masri Fatul Fitria to explain about uh, her story, about her experience. Is it part of the uh, Kadereka? Yeah, Kadereka is matching fund from the Ministry of uh, Education. And also Mas Arizal is also Kadereka, yeah? Kadereka project. 
So I have to learn. So we have to learn from you, <laughs> from her, and from him. Yeah. So without further ado, uh, please uh, 30 minutes each, and it will be followed by um, input and Q and A. Yeah. So please, if you uh, if you want to uh, have some input, you can write down, or maybe you can also uh, use Bahasa Indonesia to uh, ask if you want to. Uh, Mbak Fitri, 30 minutes, please. Okay, uh, very good morning everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <laughs> okay, thank you very much Mas Hanif for uh, the kind introduction uh, to us. Uh, well, uh, and thank you um, for having us okay, to share about our project. And then later, um, Professor, we are going to give us some input and insights about what we are doing. Uh, so start up, so probably uh, when, when uh, I was given this uh, topic, okay, by Mas Tondi, and then, okay, start up. I don't know if, uh, so hopefully uh, what we are doing um, is potential to uh, be developed for uh, start up or uh, for further business. Okay, so <coughs> uh, my title is um, a little bit uh, mouthful to um, to pronounce <laughs> decolonializing uh, decolonializing decolonializing English through culture based ESL materials um, the challenges and opportunities so why I'm uh, bringing up this topic uh, to this forum so this is actually Kedaireka uh, okay Kedaireka is um, the fund, the, the grant uh, the funding from our government from the uh, from Ministry of education and culture uh, and this is a matching fund so uh, the government match uh, the fund provided by our partner industry so a uh, one to one okay so the, ma the matching fund is uh, one to one uh, so this is my uh, previous year project so I um, so my partner last year my partner yeah oh, okay oh yeah yeah sorry okay Masih belum. <laughs> okay, okay, wait a second. Play, play, play. <coughs> okay, thank you, Butika. <coughs> okay, uh, so uh, last year my partner was uh, Peter Teman Anak Siap Hari. Uh, so this is a publishing company. <coughs> uh, so um, it comes up with, with my expertise actually, uh, so my interest at least, so not my expertise. So I'm interested in uh, English, um, especially English language policy, and then um, how it uh, affects and influences culture and all the things. Uh, so maybe if, if you have a look at uh, my slide, uh, this is the history of English, the history of the spread of English uh, in the world uh, from uh, 1066 AD, <laughs> okay, like long, long time, long, uh, like years ago. Um, like English started to spread from um, England, okay, like to the countries surrounding uh, England, and then uh, through in industrialization at first, and then colonialization. Uh, maybe if, if uh, you have heard of uh, in English uh, is in the world of empire, okay, um, like it, it spread through industrialization and, and colonialization throughout the world. And if you see in uh, 1956, like more and more countries um, have got English uh, used like in a way or another, like as, as um, <coughs> either as uh, official language as a, or maybe as the first or like maybe like coexisting nation, um, official language in the country. Uh, in 2019, more and more countries <coughs> Um, okay, are colored by English. Okay, maybe if, if you see here Indonesia, maybe you have got a question: Why Indonesia um, has got no color over there? Okay, so it relates to my next slide. Okay, um, so Katru. Okay, I forgot to write his name. Katru, Brad uh, Katru. Um, he introduced his idea about uh, the circles. Okay, so uh, the 
there are three groups of English speakers in the world. Okay, so the first is inner circle, uh, where English is used as the first language, and then uh, the outer circle it relates to the colonialization, as as we say. So British Commonwealth, like um, India, Nigeria, Malaysia. Um, okay, Australia. No, Australia is inner circle. <laughs> okay, uh, and then Indonesia belongs to the expanding circle. Okay, uh, with China, Russia, Brazil. Uh, Thailand. So English is used as uh, the uh, foreign language here. Okay. So if you see in the map, so Indonesia is not colored. So probably because this is part of the expanding circle where English is not officially used um, in in the country. Although in Indonesia we know that we use lots of English, right? Okay. And everybody is is very good at at speaking English in in this room, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> Well, and then there is uh, another movement. So in the past, uh, you, you are going to be considered as a good speaker of English if, if maybe you sound like the native speaker. But there is a question uh, in a further development. There is a question: Who is the native speaker? Are they the American, the British, the Aust uh, Australian, Canadian, or do you think that Indian are the native speaker of English? They use they have used English since uh, birth, although they have got like different accent. Uh, or maybe Malaysian are they? A native speaker of English, some of them, or Nigerian. Okay, so there is a question like that, and and probably there are lots of questions and debates about um, who is the owner of English. Okay, so uh, the further development there is world Englishes, uh, like like English belongs to the world. This is the just the lingua franca. This is just the language of communication. Uh, like, uh, if if you want to speak English, you don't have to speak like Harry Potter. Hermione, open the door, please. Okay, not, not like that. Or <laughs> maybe you want to be like Texan, or okay, because maybe if you go to England uh, or the UK, when you go to Scotland, so you will hear people speak differently. Or maybe in in Manchester, uh, they speak differently. If you hear David Beckham talking, it will be different uh, from the Queen. Or maybe in London, Masani, maybe in, in different part. Masani used to live in London, uh, and in every different, but even different villages, they have got different accent. Okay, so there is a problem here, yeah. So native speakerism has been challenged, so it will it has become problematic. So with the world English says everybody owns English. Probably in the future we will have English, yeah. Maduris English. Well, good morning, everyone. Okay, in this very good occasion, <laughs> or maybe Jingles, yeah. Okay, in this very uh, good morning. Okay, we, okay, okay. So probably yeah, in the future, but that's okay. Uh, if you want to speak English, if if you have some sense of accent, that's fine. That's all right. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Uh, I once asked my friend uh, when I was younger, maybe about 20 years, 10, 20 years ago, <laughs> when, when I was still obsessed with uh, native sound okay uh, I asked my friend do you think I sound like uh, maybe like some native speaker maybe American British or something and then she say it's okay P3 you sound like yourself uh, okay and then I recorded myself and oh yeah uh, I, I, I'm still Indonesian okay I, I heard I hear lots of Indonesian accent in, in my English and, and that is fine if, if for example if you go uh, maybe in the future I did, I did maybe if you go study in um, the USA, for example, yeah, or uh, the UK, like Masanif, okay, or maybe Australia, or uh, somewhere in in uh, Asia, or in Japan, like Masrondi, is that correct, Masrondi Japan, yeah. So you will have lots of international friends, and they speak English differently, okay, and that's fine. Okay, that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so that's that's actually um, the um, the philosophy behind my um, the product that we develop, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so from that, can okay, we jump to here? Yeah. Why English uh, teaching materials? Um, so actually, my product is um, English teaching materials for children in Indonesia. Uh, this is culture-based, so um, folklore. So so uh, we develop the product based on Indonesian folklore. Okay. If you know cerita uh, rakyat, yeah, or Indonesian folk tales. Uh, why teaching materials? Because um, based on the research and in reality, we know that uh, there are still problems with uh, the availability of uh, teaching materials, yeah, especially good teaching materials, especially for young learners. Uh, because if young learners, maybe if, if we give them um, like not really accurate input and then 
it, it's going to be fertilized, so to say they are going to use it uh, for the rest of their life. So, uh, and also um, that's this one reason, and maybe if you have heard of, um, okay, uh, uh, profile pelajar Pancasila, okay, the profile of uh, Pancasila student, okay, so there is a uh, berkebinikan global and also the other uh, profiles, okay, so we based also our product on uh, on those philosophy. Okay, if you see traditional ELT materials, so usually um, maybe you, you uh, maybe you, you have learned English for long and you have used lots of materials, like maybe if you see lots of books, uh, they talk about the Thames River, or maybe they talk about Paris and all other international um, elements. Is that correct? Yeah, maybe if you remember, if if you learn English, yeah, okay. And and uh, we don't have lots of materials um, which derive from Indonesian culture. <laughs> okay, or probably at the moment, if if uh, because in Indonesia, I know that we use uh, gender-based, yeah, gender-based education. And um, you have narrative, and in narrative, sometimes you use the story of Cinderella, okay, or um, Hansel and Gretel, okay, or maybe uh, Snow White and some others, okay. And probably also you use some Indonesian fairy tales. Uh, but I heard from the teachers uh, because I'm, I'm in the faculty of education. I have lots of. Uh, teacher partners, I heard from them that uh, it's difficult for them to uh, to choose the um, stories that is from Indonesia because some of them contain some sexual content. Okay, maybe if you know the story of Banyuwangi, <laughs> okay, uh, the, or maybe some in, um, incest, or maybe uh, some violence. Maybe if you know Sangkuriang, or maybe if uh, and maybe some. Uh, things that is questionable um, based on the morality of Pancasila, for example, like in Cindelaras, you see uh, the, they are gambling uh, for for a uh, cock fight, the rooster fight, okay. not chicken fight, yeah, <laughs> chicken fight, okay, fried chicken, yeah, <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, we base also our product on uh, those things as well. And then uh, we, we, we discuss, like me and my partner industry, my team and partner industry, we discuss, and then we found an idea, okay, what about writing uh, culture-based ELT materials, <laughs> okay? Why culture-based ELT materials? Maybe I have introduced, given the introduction, long introduction, and uh, there is also um, the research and the writing of Pak Haiwel Coleman, okay? Pak Haiwel has, has lived in Indonesia for about 25 years, yeah, he, he is actually from the UK. And uh, he wrote that um, actually English uh, language can be Naga, Naga uh, that is differing the national language. And, but actually national language can be also na uh, like, maybe snake, yeah, what is smaller than Naga? <laughs> uh, that is eating uh, the vernacular language. So language actually, uh, th there are lots of uh, politics actually behind the language, okay, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know, your, ba uh, your background is different, yeah? Maybe you have different background from myself, but maybe if you think, ah, yeah, when I speak Japanese, I feel different. When I speak Bahasa Indonesia, I will feel different. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Okay, and then uh, this is also uh, global diversity as one of uh, Pancasila student profile. Okay, and then uh, in my title, I wrote challenges. What are the challenges? Maybe I have told you that some folk tales are not children friendly, so, uh, we have got to find ways to make it children friendly. So um, we, we change some part in the story that um, we, we do not include. Uh, so like we, we try to eliminate violence and then sexual content and also, uh, for example, the gambling, we remove that. Uh, maybe some people have got the idea, oh, I think it's, it's good. Um, it is okay to introduce children to those kind of thing as, as long as we, um, we we guide them that this is not correct, but but we think that okay uh, maybe for the early age uh, we want to introduce children to the safe content first. Maybe if uh, like later when when they are in senior high school, probably it's okay if, if they know like the the actual story. And then the production cost, and then the production process as well. So, uh, but Alhamdulillah, like we we got uh, the grant, we got the funding from Kedai Reka, so we can. 
uh, do our project yeah and then the production process we have got our mitra we have got our partner partner industry so um, okay we can do it <laughs> okay the opportunities um, yeah so there is an increasing demand for materials to strengthen uh, character pelajar Pancasila ya or Pancasila student profile maybe if, if you have heard of that Okay, and then um, why we are going digital? Uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, our, I'm going to tell you our product a little bit more. Um, we include digital, we uh, have digital product as well because we consider that uh, like students, teachers, and parents after the pandemic, they are become more familiar with the digital technology. So it's, it's going to be no problem. Probably before the pandemic, uh, like parents are going to complain like why do you give uh, the children digital uh, material in case they are going to be to, to be difficult to access but at the moment after the pandemic I think everybody is more digital savvy is that correct okay maybe in the past if you only have one post in TikTok and now you have ten. Oh no yeah <laughs> bukan itu ya <laughs> okay just kidding okay and then uh, the next one there are only few competitors available uh, mostly the materials are available in the printed version okay uh, anybody maybe want to ask me kenapa ini gambar buaya why is it crocodile over here <laughs> ini hiasan saja ya so this is just decoration <laughs> okay Okay, so uh, our potential startup is called Nusa Storia. Nusa Storia, uh, we developed this after we have the product. Uh, how will we sell it? So we, we uh, create a platform called Nusa Storia uh, where um, we sell the products and then you can download the application and then enjoy all the features in it, including uh, audio book uh, and then AR. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is our uh, books. So we have five stories. Okay, uh, please apologize for, for this in a title. Uh, we have five stories. Um, and why, why these five stories? Because it represents um, like Indonesia from Sabang to Merauke. If you see Mahakam is in Kalimantan, in Borneo, and then this is from Java, Cindelaras, and then Crocodile of Tamir River is from Papua, and then Golden Dragon of Ranau Lake is from Lampung, and the Deer and Hermit Crab is from Maluku, Sulawesi. Okay, so it represents uh, like also a little bit, uh, why only one from its region? We want more, but uh, with some limitations, so these are the sample and we can develop uh, this product later on okay and then we have um, audio books uh, maybe if, if you want okay can you hear it not yet okay oh yes okay I'm, I'm going to play uh, okay a little bit Okay, so uh, all the five books uh, have got the audio book company in. Okay. Can you hear it on Zoom? No, because I have not shared my sound yet. I believe so. <laughs> okay. Can you hear it now? Okay. <laughs> okay, maybe. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Or maybe because it's this. Um, low okay. <laughs> okay okay I have start my sound oh, okay. <laughs> Mahakam River once upon a time in a village lived a brother and a sister with their father they loved to play in their father's rice field. One day, they ran here and there. Accidentally, they ruined some paddy seedlings. Their father was really angry. You! You better be porpoises! Okay, so that's the sample audio book. Okay, so actually the music, the music background is also uh, created by 
um, by traditional, not, not really traditional, contemporary musician interested in uh, Indonesian traditional uh, music. So that's, um, so he created the music uh, with music instrument from the five different regions. So if you listen to Cindelaras, you are going to listen to some gamelan, not gamelan, yeah, gamelan, <laughs> some gamelan, and, and uh, uh, Papua is going to be different as well. Okay, example. Uh, we have application as well, the Nusa Soria uh, application. Maybe if you if you have time later, you can download it. But um, maybe it's uh, like if you have you have got to have uh, the um, the printed um, card maybe to enjoy uh, to enjoy the the uh, AR. Yeah? <laughs> okay, okay. And then we have, uh, we are going to put our, uh, I have not checked the, the current um, development, so I think uh, the developer has put also the audio book in, in the, in the uh, application. Okay, so we have a flashcard with embedded 3D uh, AR, augmented reality animation. Okay, so it, um, so all the cards are, we, we take the vocabulary from the stories, okay, so the children can get to know more about Indonesian um, culture, animals, and everything. I see, maybe if you see the hermit, the hermit has got uh, Kalimantan, uh, the headpiece from Kalimantan, like, like uh, that's from Dayak, uh, Dayak tribe, yeah? And also Arwana, Arwana is uh, like fish from Kalimantan as well, orangutan, okay. <laughs> this is from one story, okay. Okay, so this is the flashcard. So we have uh, the English English uh, word and then Bahasa Indonesia word. And uh, in the uh, in the AR, if we if you scan uh, this picture uh, with the apps, and then um, th there's going to be the sound and also uh, the the 3D picture of it. I'm going to give you example later on. Okay, like this one. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this is a sample. Princes and their palaces? Sure, we have it. What about listening to okay, those stories now? Trick. Yay! Let's do it! Wonderful Indonesia. So, have it. Okay, that's our Princes song. Princes and their palaces? We have song as well, okay. Um, some people ask me, is that you singing? No, that's not me, that's a professional singer <laughs> singing them. <laughs> okay, okay uh, and then this is, um, yeah, this is our team. Okay, harusnya di belakang lagi, sorry. Okay, and we have the song that I have introduced you just now, yeah. Um, and this is the, the creative process. Okay, wait a second. Do I still have time, Mas Hanif? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to make it bigger. So this is the creative process and then the research process that, that we did. Um, okay, from the start of the project. Uh, this is just, just uh, short, very, very short uh, snippet yeah, into what we have done. You can hear some music instrument from this
Okay, okay, so that's uh, our project. So uh, maybe if you have some insights, some suggestions, or maybe questions, uh, I will be open for that. Uh, thank you very much, Mas Hanif. Okay, thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you very much, Mbak Fitri. It reminds me a lot about the cultural gap that my son had after returning from the UK because um, we went to Gramedia bookstore several times every year to just to buy books for, for him. But uh, it is very unfortunate that uh, the collection of the uh, children book is very limited. So okay. this will become, the, uh, uh, I think, uh, how to fill the demand from the, uh, the children, yeah? Okay. Uh, because I didn't find uh, story books in English, but it is based on the Indonesian culture. So we have to find another book. This is about universe, World War II. So now my son uh, knows very well about the uh, universe, about okay. uh, Captain America, <laughs> <laughs> about uh, uh, football, kaca, yeah? football players. Okay, so football because uh, he doesn't have any okay. choices. And then uh, I think this is really, really good. Thank so you. from from this presentation, I know that uh, the more I know about English, the more I know that I I have never made a mistake in spelling. <laughs> Pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. Pronunciation. So it's I know okay. that yeah, okay. I, I have a friend from Newcastle, and then when uh, when he said very young, oh very young. The bus. So, so the yeah. bus is coming. <laughs> the bus is coming, <laughs> and in the bank. And then so. <laughs> So yeah. there is no mistake in spelling and pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mbak Fitri. So yeah, we move welcome. to the second speaker, Mas okay. Arizal Mujib Tamala Nanda Imron. Sorry. Time is, yes, yeah, please. Let, let me give some yeah, two please. points. Please, um, Professor yeah. Andreas. Yes, um, I like the idea. Um, uh, it makes sense. And I, it's funny because in, in Germany, we, we also speak Denglish. English. English, yes. English, English. <laughs> yes, <It's okay. laughs> so my English is also not perfect. Um, um, you know about uh, your product, I think it depends on the age of the, of the kids um, because um, in, in Germany and Europe we try to reduce the, the display time for young kids. Um, uh, experts are suggesting that if, if the kid is between, uh, let's say, four and six, one hour per day is enough. So um, there's a product in Germany, it's called um, Tony's. Um, can I share um, the screen, is it possible? Um, it's a display-free solution, um, with uh, also very kid-friendly. Um, let me try to share. Um, where's my browser? Right here. Um, so, Maybe it's possible um, or it fits for your market. Let me go to tonys.com. It's a, it's a kid-free, a, a kid-friendly box um, with, with items like small um, pictures, uh, uh, figures from fairy tales, like animals. Um, you can, with predefined um, fairy tales, um, you can also buy Tonys, um, with uh, creative tools, that means you can upload your own content and there's a license on it and you put the um, item on the box and it down it will download uh, the fairy tale mm -hmm. and um, it's it's a very good business model because um, they have these features and um, they earn money with the licenses mm -hmm. and it's it's um, it's a it's a top seller in Germany yeah. and you the kids don't need a smartphone um, Maybe this also work for your for your um, country as well, mm. and um, yes, the other thing is um, there was a second point. Um, mm, bum, 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 bum. Don't know yet. <laughs> I forgot it. So okay. yes, that was just advice. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. This is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Andreas. Um, the Mas 
I have to, I have to read your name okay? because it is very long. <laughs> Arizal Mujib Tamala Nanda Imron. So uh, I can call you Nanda, maybe Imron, or maybe Arizal or Tam. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I got the yeah, missing yeah, point. Please, please. Um, with your cards, um, if you if you put a gamification point into it, let's say, okay, uh, trying to let the kids answer questions, how, what's the size of a crocodile, or how old can a orang udang become, you will also have a learning effect within augmented reality features. Yeah, so, it, in, yeah. it also remind me about the, um, my son. He doesn't know about kadal, yeah, so he. Oh, yeah, he always said, oh, lizard, 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 because he doesn't know the translation in the books. Yeah. Oh. So, kadal, it is kadal, no, lizard, lizard. <laughs> then, uh, what he likes a lot about, um, uh, you know, mashed potato, because uh, when, we, uh, when we were in London, we always uh, eat potato. So, we, we uh, eat mashed potato, now we don't have mashed potato. We have jemblem, right? <laughs> jemblem is mashed cassava, so I don't want to introduce mashed cassava to him because he will refuse. So when he said, what is it, mashed potato, then eat it. Very cheap, 1,000 rupiah, enough. Okay, so that's really, really good. <laughs> but we three can move to, yeah, 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 food, yeah, Indonesian food in children's books. Okay, Mastama, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, excuse me, I will uh, present my, in, in Indonesia, it's okay, yeah. Uh, I, can <laughs> yes, he will use Bahasa Indonesia. Speak, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, mix, but uh, can you uh, present in English? Mm. Perhaps uh, Professor Andreas can have an yeah, feeling well. <laughs> Mbak Fitri, please help. Mbak Fitri, that's, that's your, yeah, your, your job, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's Indo, Indo <laughs> English. English is very well. <laughs> <laughs> that's your job. Yeah, I will interpret for you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oke, okay. oke. Okay. Uh, ini uh, tentang teaching factory yang berbasis uh, terkait startup yang berbasis teaching factory yang ini uh, tentang uh, aplikasi GIS atau Geographic Information System for the untuk untuk kebencanaan. Oke. Okay. Uh, pertama kali kami tim kami membuat uh, penelitian ini berdasarkan pada masalah-masalah uh, yang ada di Jember khususnya mulai dari tahun 2018, 13 dan lain-lain kita ngambil garis besar kalau di Jember ini ada banyak masalah terkait kebencanaan khususnya di kebencanaan yang terkait banjir atau juga gelombang tinggi atau juga puting beliung data-data tersebut diambil dari badan BNPB atau badan penanggulangan bencana nasional di mana Jember ini termasuk dalam kategori rasio kebencanaan yang tinggi di atas 144 Kemudian riset dari tim kami dimulai ketika tahun 2014 hingga 2020 kemarin yang merupakan uh, dari hibah internal UNED dan juga kita ajukan kepada hibah DRPM dari mulai tahun 2014 sampai dengan 2020 uh, kami membuat early warning system untuk kebencanaan banjir, tanah longsor puting beliung maupun gelombang tinggi. Nah, dari hibah-hibah tersebut, kita membuat sebuah alat, kemudian kita kembangkan ke prototipe dan kita terapkan di masyarakat untuk memberikan impact pada kebencanaan yang ada di Jember. Kemudian di antara tahun tersebut, kita juga diundang oleh BNPB Bogor untuk melakukan pameran terkait kebencanaan di sana. Selanjutnya pada tahun 2021 uh, baru dibuka terkait hilirisasi matching fund di mana dia memungkinkan untuk uh, step up dari produk-produk yang sudah kita teliti dan kita terapkan di masyarakat 
pada tahun 2021 kita coba untuk melakukan hilirisasi di matching fund di mana di sini kita tujukan untuk membuat sebuah early warning system sebuah sistemnya sebuah fisiknya yang memiliki standarisasi ketika proses uh, hilirisasi matching fund ini uh, kita melibatkan um, kita melibatkan mitra industri, ada Indidaya, Dinamika Sejati, dan PT Metro Mesin. Kemudian ketika kita lihat dalam pembelajaran teaching faktorinya, kita melibatkan mahasiswa dan kita konversikan ke dalam uh, pembelajaran mata kuliah. Kemudian ketika pengerjaan ada di bagian mitra, nanti kita terapkan program magang sehingga dapat dikonversi menjadi uh, MBKM 20 SKS. Kemudian luaran dari tahun 2021 yang merupakan hilirisasi ini, kita memiliki sebuah produk early warning system dan dua buah uji standarisasi di mana kita melakukan uji standarisasi di badan di Balai Standarisasi Pelayanan Jasa Industri yang ada di Surabaya di mana balai tersebut merupakan uh, bagian dari Kementerian Perindustrian. Kemudian ketika tahun 2022 kita coba untuk naikkan lagi melalui program startup di program Hibah Matching Fund. Di sini kita coba membuat semacam apa namanya pendahuluan sebelum masuk ke startup. Kita buat konsepnya sehingga Ketika tahun 2022 berakhir, kita memiliki konsep uh, untuk startup dari early warning system yang berbasis dengan GIS. Di sini pada tahun 2022, kita dan tim uh, berdiskusi juga dengan uh, Bupati Jember dan menerapkan beberapa EWS di beberapa tempat. Salah satunya ini ada di uh, apa namanya hulu, hulu sungai yang merupakan sumber dari bencana banjir. Jadi ketika kita pasang ini, kita juga bekerja sama dengan BNPB uh, kebencanaan di Jember, termasuk juga kita koordinasi dengan Bapak Bupati untuk pengaplikasinya ini, sehingga kita di sini ketika tahun 2022, kita membentuk skema di mana uh, prodi kami dapat membuat sebuah EWS ini bekerja sama dengan industri kita bagi uh, pengerjaannya kalau kita tidak memiliki alat-alat dan kita memiliki apa namanya tim ahli terkait pembuatannya maka kita terapkan itu di program magang di mana program magang itu nanti dibimbing oleh industri dalam pengerjaannya sedangkan yang ada di kita di teaching factory kita kita ajukan di mata kuliah-mata kuliah yang berhubungan dengan pembuatan EWS dan juga pengembangan dari sistem tersebut berkaitan dengan uh, perguruan tinggi juga yang berbasis riset teaching factory. Ah, ini merupakan salah satu contoh dari aplikasi GIS yang kita gunakan. Uh, kita gunakan ini untuk mendeteksi adanya banjir dan lain-lain dan dalam pengajarannya kita li bisa lihat sini kita melibatkan mahasiswa kita terapkan teaching faktornya tersebut sehingga apa yang kita kerjakan dapat bermanfaat untuk mahasiswa dan juga masyarakat begitu uh, secara garis besar uh, untuk Teaching faktor yang kita bentuk mulai tahun dari Darbu. Please help me. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, this project is um, through their team, they create the early warning system for, for flood risk. Okay, so because uh, Jember is a disaster prone area, disaster prone, yeah. uh, we have got lots of uh, flood uh, yearly. And um, so they, uh, they, they work with uh, the industry to create uh, the early warning system in this and we um to be installed in some areas in Jember only in Jember only in Jember only oh and and also for hurricane 
Yeah. Early warning system for oh for flood, landslide, exactly. hurricane as yeah. well. Okay. Or from seaside and landslide flood. Uh, seaside oh. seaside flood or the river flood. River, river, river flood. Oh, river flood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And the, and then the hurricane and landslide. Okay. So um so so. So you have got have you did a mass production? Mass production. Okay, so it's been it's been mass produced. Um, it, so it's been on the market as well. Uh, okay. Kita mulai. Oh yeah. Okay, so um, so it's been mass produced and has been standardized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have already existing customers. No. Uh, untuk sekarang untuk saat ini kita masih mengembangkan dan masih bekerja sama dengan uh, government. Apa, government untuk oh, okay. so, so the, apply the, the, oh, okay so uh, the existing customer is actually the government at the uh, moment okay. so yeah how, how many units has been sold uh, until uh, two, oh, unit, uh, two unit two unit two unit yang sudah dipasang ini oh, okay in so you have installed two units uh, in Jember in Jember in Jember okay. that's that's for flat hmm. is it already proof already proven yes, yeah. okay it's working yeah. it's so yes. uh, it's, did, you, did, did you had a flood and it was a free warning before yeah yeah okay so never happened yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. so your product is working in your yes okay <laughs> so uh, how um, how much does it cost for one unit to build the cost uh, estimate estimate uh, sekitar 30 sampai 5 uh, 30 sampai 35 untuk million, yeah? million. Million. untuk million proteksinya oh, okay. Protection. Protection. So it, it is around uh, one uh, no uh, two, yeah, two, yeah, two thousand euros yeah. two thousand euro production production fee so if the cost is two thousand how will you how much will you sell for the cost uh, uh, each cost it, it's unit ah. On one unit? Yeah, yeah. Mm. If the cost is two thousands, and how will how much will you sell the oh. uh, every? Kita uh, mencoba untuk memplacing uh, harganya di sekitar antara empat lima sampai lima lima. Kita nanti tergantung dari speknya dan uh, apa namanya, termasuk juga servis satu tahun pergantian dan lain-lain seperti itu. So if two thousand and then you will sell two thousand and five hundred. Mm. So you will have benefit 500. That's very cheap. <laughs> you will not get rich as a researcher, eh? So yes. Yes. <laughs> how, many, Andreas, please. yes. How, many, how many items you need for a, a certain square meter area to, to cover uh, the complete district or let's say to cover the complete coast? How many items you need? How many? Uh, jadi kalau kita mengcovernya itu kita taruh di hulu sungainya, tapi kita mempunyai aplikasi yang dapat dipantau di sini. Jadi pihak kebencanaan di sini bisa memantaunya itu. Kita memperkirakan kan kalau hulu ketinggian sekian atau mungkin hulunya ada kenaikan dari airnya itu 2000 atau berapa sekian, memperkirakan nyampe sini sekian gitu. Jadi One per sungai, one, yeah. unit, yeah. one, one unit. Okay. One unit. Maybe the potential because in Indonesia there are lots of rivers. Hmm. Like, like how many thousands of rivers in Indonesia? Kalau kita nerapannya biasanya bukan di hilirnya, tadi kita lihat di hulunya aja. Hulu. Only hulu. Yeah. Itu berapa ribu kira-kira? Yang merupakan sumber dari kebencanaannya. Oh. Berarti unitnya itu harus dia apakah harus tenggelam air, ar oh. membaca air, ketinggian air atau bagaimana? Ada macam-macam jenis, ada yang di ada yang sensornya ditenggelamkan, ada yang di atas juga bisa bergantung Kalau atas ininya. berarti dia membaca. membaca. Oke. Okay. So, translate I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. I I would expect I I was one I was wondering because I think you can buy let's say a weather station Um, a personal weather station, weather station will cost around right about 100 euro, 150 euro, and you can collect data. 
um, maybe this is a bit more complex, which it, 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 it has to fit other requirements, industrial requirements and whatever, you need a certain certification, of course. But I'm first I'm wondering about the high production price. And the second thing is, um, if I would expect uh, a price on market two or three times or four times higher than your production price because um, it's electronic inside and um, electronic can be damaged, um, uh, it's not working properly maybe, it depends on the quality of the, of the items, you need to maintenance it. Um, uh, so uh, I think a margin of 500 euro will be too less for it. So if, you, if we want to produce uh, stuff, so we have to see similar product with a similar price. Yeah. The competitors. Yeah, the competitors. Do you want Is to see around that? 100 euro in the work middle station? Uh, I have two in my garden. It's not very expensive and mm. data is collected in a system. I can share it. Um, other mm. forecast companies use the, uh, the data as well. Um, where it cleans the data, um, data is also collected by aircrafts and send it to the telemetry and the data to, uh, to professionals. So um, maybe uh, the next question would be, how about your competition? Um, do you have already existing competitors? How easy is it for government to replace your products or to use other services to, to predict flood and, and other things? It's, yeah. Very good input, yes. Um, now time is yours, Professor Andreas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, let me share the screen. And hopefully it will work. Okay, so thank you for invitation, thank you for your interest. It's nice to, to be here and talk to you. I will give you a short and brief introduction about, let's say, um, the startup culture and the ecosystem in, in Germany and um, some, some data about University of Flensburg. Um, I will give you also a, a kind of overview uh, how do we see with the future of education as well as um, um, for startups in Germany? And um, I, will, I will close with um, a possible future ecosystem which, which will handle um, a startup culture in, 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 re in research and in education. Um, well, it's, it's a kind of personal opinion from my side. Um, and let's see how it will come. Um, so where do we currently stand? Flensburg um, is one of the leading startup universities in, in Germany, um, even if we are more like a small um, university together with um, our partner university, we will have um, only 10,000 students roundabout on our campus. But um, in 2022, um, there were 71 ideas generated um, by students. Um, 16 startups were founded. Um, that means we will have 17.9 startups per 100,000 residents in a, in a region. The national average is 3.1 startups. So we have five to six times more startups compared to, to other regions. We are ranked um, within the top five of um, small sized universities from our um, startup out uh, output. We also rank in the top 20 compared to medium-sized universities. And um, for startup anchoring, qualification and sensitization, um, we are ranked in the top three and we are top one ranked for small-sized universities in the category of startup support in general. Uh, these are good numbers even if only 10% of our modules or lectures are related to startup topics. So we could, we could um, um, perform much more better if we would or set our focus more to startups, to research and uh, education. So we have um, two major programs. Um, that means they are already existing since um, years. 
and we have one additional program which um, um, was intended to be started uh, in 2020 and we all know COVID came yeah, and changed some circumstances. Um, so we start the third program, it's called Test Up um, this year. So the Startup um, Schleswig-Holstein program is um, um, public funded by the federal state of Schleswig-Holstein and the European Union. Um, the Venture Werft is a partly private and partly um, public funded um, program by federal state of Schleswig-Holstein, by Bundesministerium for, um, for Education and for Research, the European Union, and by um, clubs and associations in Schleswig-Holstein. Um, it's a kind of um, program from idea generation up to um, uh, founding a startup, like you use Kanban for, produ for produce something. And we have TestUp, it's uh, a kind of startup village for technology-based startups. It's public funded by the Bundesministerium for Bildung und Forschung. It's like a government for research and education. Um, here you can see um, the Startup SH, um, a lot of people um, from universities, from politics and from clubs are joining together, try to create um, a startup culture program. Um, we have associations uh, like digital um, business in Schleswig-Holstein and they give their knowledge, they try to give resources and um, help um, people to start up, especially we have a lot of um, um, programs in the direction of women, that women will start up their own company, also in the, in the direction of um, sustainable uh, and renewable energies and business. So this is the Venture Werft uh, concept. It's a cross-border collaboration between Germany and Denmark, and Venture Werft means a shipyard um, uh, where ships will be produced. It's a, it's a word for werft. Um, and we have um, five, uh, six dogs, and um, every dog is having its own, let's say, focus from IT development and business model development up to optimization or growth. Um, also, uh, there's also a talk about uh, how to found a uh, company uh, with all of the law things and regulations, um, how to find the right um, um, uh, form for the company, and also to help in, 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 in case of crisis. Um, yes, um, students are running through different talks and students are also joining from Germany and Denmark together to, to work uh, within startups. And the test up ecosystem um, is having different phases um, or focuses, let's say from sensitizing for startup topics. We have a software factory, we have opportunity space. It's a kind of using different techniques like Lego series play or design thinking to create first ideas based on a, on a customer benefit or a, or a customer problem. We have the Venture Dog and Ideenreich is a fab lab. Students can use um, 3D printing, can use a microcontroller um, to, to create first products or ideas. Um, when um, it goes to the development of startup ideas, we have the opportunity space again, we have Dog One from Venture Werft, also a soft factory and the Ideenreich, the fab lab thing. Um, so we have also the business model, startup and financing topic, we have a prototyping, minimal viable product topic, and then go to market. It's, um, it's supported by the Technology Center in Flensburg, also by IHK Flensburg, it's a kind of association for, uh, for industrial companies um, and from, from public um, um, entities as well. So and um, we have also a point or phase for growth and optimization. Um, this desktop ecosystem is managed and supported by uh, private companies or economy as well as by public entities and by universities. And um, this, is, uh, this was the overview about the ecosystem we will have or we have right now in Flensburg. Um, other, I, th I think other companies, uh, under other cities, under other universities will have a similar ecosystem. With, with, with certain programs to, to enable startups or to force students or to enable students to have a startup. Um, it's not that different. Um, 
what we see in the future is um, that more and more students um, um, uh, try to uh, to want to study competen competency-based and self-directed uh, programs uh, and uh, have a degree also in that direction. Um, but um, competence requires knowledge, and is knowledge already is it a competence to to have knowledge, or are learning outcomes um, um, will gener uh, will generate um, competencies? Not sure. Um, actually, traditional study programs um, are focusing on um, learning outcomes. Um, students learn uh, theories. Um, they become very um, expertized in theories. But um, is it already a competence for um, for running a digital transformation in companies, for being um, um, good presenters, um, or if they are able to, to manage a team or to work within a team. I'm not sure, I don't think so. But people want to learn it, and um, it's uh, one, uh, one thing that's important. So we, we're talking about uh, future skills uh, in Europe. Um, uh, we have different programs, which I say um, uh, six, I think 17 um, certain skills, which are important for managing the digital area, era, uh, which, uh, which helps people to to face the digital change, and um, we all know that educational and teaching methods need to to meet those um, future skills. Um, and um, yes, um, here's an overview about the future skills. Can you can you read it? Okay, maybe it's different for uh, for people looking to the wall. Um, Future skills are competencies that um, allow individuals to solve complex problems in a self-organized way. Um, and um, they are able to, to act successfully in a highly emergent context. Soft skills can be self-determination, can be digital literacy, can be self issuacy can be um, design thinking competence, everything which goes over traditional having a s expertise in a special field. So this is the future skills map, um, which is our focus. And we think about, OK, um, what's important in future? How can, how can teaching looks like? How can education looks like? Um, um, what are requirements um, from, from students, future students? Um, how, to, how to get those soft, uh, how get developed in, in those soft skills? And we know that mastering learning, team learning, flipped classroom, peer learning, um, a multi-stage lesson procedure to, um, to um, onboard new students, problem-oriented learning, entrepreneurial thinking and acting, as well as interdisciplinary offers, high practical project relevance, competency development, personal development, reflectivity is important to teach soft skills or, um, or um, to, to help um, our students to develop their skills. Um, we also think that, um, that um, uh, bringing some kind of mentoring or coaching models or rules into, uh, into a study program is also very important to teach um, soft skills. And um, the build, measure, learn approach from Lean Startup is or will be a very central component of a learning process. Um, Yes, what we also see is that artificial intelligence is becoming more and more relevant. We as lecturers or as uh, skilled people know that since years that uh, AI is important and will become important, but especially since the success and the media presence of ChatGPT, everyone is asking about um, artificial intelligence. We know teachers are fear of, ah, oh, how can we how can we check if our uh, uh, pupils or or uh, students didn't uh, use um, uh, ChatGPT for for their um, uh, for the work and um, um, uh, like cheating. Yeah. Um, I, yesterday I saw a funny picture that in 1985 math teachers went out of the building and say, "Hey, stop the usage of calculators. Of yeah, we don't use it because pupils can cheat." Yeah. And now we have see teachers, we are going out, they stop, um, we have to avoid chat GPT. Um, so history repeats, um, but we need to deal with it, yes. Um, on the Friday lecture, uh, with, with students from your university, 
um, I try to implement the uses of ChatGPT within the lecture. Um, uh, so ways of teaching will change dramatically as well as ways of learning. We as, uh, we as professors, as lecturers, our rule will be changed. We will become moderators, um, we will become coaches. Our job will be to, to transfer the knowledge into practice, to help the students, um, to teach the soft skills within a special industry or dom domain you will, you will own, like um, geosystems or medicine or law or um, economy. This is our new job. Um, in 2030, I'm sure that uh, AI will, will, will prepare lectures and the study program for, for students based on their, on their, um, on their needs and um, their, their way they want to go. So algorithms will, will create study programs and um, the selection of modules, not, not we as to, uh, lecturers. So the time of um, fixed study programs and the keys uh, will be over. Um, what we also can see, it's, it's a, a study from World Economic Forum and Roland Berger, is that we will have an increasing demand in, in, in job roles um, containing data analysis and um, software engineering and artificial intelligence. That means data analysts and scientists will be um, will be demanded very high, as well as AI, machine learning specialists, big data specialists, digital marketing and strategy specialists as well, because you need to build products based on, on the technologies. Um, process automation, automation specialists will be looked for, uh, business development professionals, digital transformation specialists. All of those um, rules um, are affected by software technology, by IT knowledge, by project management knowledge. It's all about digital transformation and automatization. Um, decreasing demand you will have in typical, simple economic job um, roles, um, like data entry clerks, like you know, simple administrative tasks, secretary tasks, accounting, um, business services, client information, um, machinery manager, financial analysts, we, we, I think we don't need them any longer uh, after five or six to seven years running ChatGPT and all of the opportunities and um, possibilities with it. So is studying traditional economics or business administration, is it a good idea any longer without having IT knowledge? Mm, maybe, but I don't think so. Yeah. So um, study programs also need to have changed. 13 of those 15 rules um, are covered by business information technology. That means um, in, in, in Germany we have a special model of computer science in combination with economics. It's called business information technology. It's a, it's a rule in between. Um, and, and the classic business visualization um, will be increasingly um, uh, thing by, or being replaced by AI. So, what is the future? I think um, classic business administration or management will, will implement or integrate more IT knowledge into the, uh, into the subjects. If, if you have, let's say, uh, marketing, uh, marketing lecturers or new marketing professors need to have knowledge about uh, possibilities in terms of artificial intelligence, also in human resource management or in sales or in logistics, yes? Um, in, in, in Germany, new professors or new staff um, will be employed mostly if they are also bringing that knowledge in. Yeah. So business administration will become digital. There's a transition into that field. Um, yes, and um, there's also one question, how can we address uh, and, um, and market the change of the interests of, of students and also of companies which demand their new skills. It's one major question. Um, and how can we address it with given resources? So we're thinking about um, try to, to create or new ways of teaching of study programs which allow much more flexibility in, uh, in, the, in the interests, in the path of starting something, getting a degree, 
So we say 80% can be core still. That means basics of software engineering, user experience or usability, um, project management, process management. We can use, we can still use it. But students are interested in how can I manage a transformation? Um, how uh, is a, how can I apply AI in a technological way? Or how can I manage AI? Um, how can I create a digital strategy? Or um, students are interested in all of those marketing topics um, related to digital business. So we try to use 80% core lectures or modules and we bring in 20% focus. This is the first low-hanging fruit approach to say, okay, how can we be, become more flexible? Um, and um, um, there's a, a program, it's called Team Academy. I don't know if you know the, the, the approach of Team Academy. This is allowing um, students to work as teams to pick their own um, topics of interest. And um, a team academy is intended um, to, to build a startup. So you can decide um, if you want to, uh, to go into a transformation way, administration or software engineering topic. Uh, you are also allowed or it's also possible that you go into the media topic also um, uh, with focus on digital business or digital startup. And um, I will explain it a bit more in detail in the next few slides. And if you combine um, Team Academy approach with um, parallel with a traditional uh, study program, students can also switch. And maybe um, if students come in and say, oh, I want to study something with AI and sustainability, or some will say, I'm interested in digital business and Internet of Things. Or some will say, okay, I think uh, business, is, business is very interesting for me, but also the topic of strategy. Um, they first can join a team academy, but if they think, ah, oh, I'm more interested in becoming an expert in artificial intelligence and management, they will switch to a uh, classic traditional student program and the other way around. So we try to create also more flexibility in such a transition phase. But what, what are team academies? Team academies allow a competency-based, self-directed learning. They were founded in 1993, uh, 1993 uh, by the marketing lecturer Johannes Patanen in Finland. And he said, I, I don't like traditional old and inefficient teaching methods anymore. I don't want to stay in front of students and talk about theory. And um, uh, at the end of a semester, I will give an exam. It's not the way students um, will apply their knowledge in a company. Um, so he started, or he has started an entrepreneurship center of excellence, and um, students have organized by themselves, has picked up their, their learning um, focuses by themselves and was more self-directed. You can see the link um, below. I will share the presentation if you're interested in. Um, and you can also have a look to the history and to the details of team um, academies. But overall, um, uh, team academy is about doing business. You don't have fixed courses and lectures. Um, you will, students will become and act as entrepreneurs with their own companies from the beginning of a study until the end of the studies. It's a safe environment. You can do mistakes, you can learn. And um, typically, um, 10 to 15 people or students will, will stay in one team, and each team starts a company, a real company. They're starting between three and four years, um, and they finish it with a trip around the business world, and, and maybe they generate some first profits uh, with, with their business. So and for me, as a program manager, I have two important questions for the future of study programs overall and how to, to strengthen our um, startup culture and startup output. The first is how do we become best in class in future in digital entrepreneurship education with an international attention? Because we know in Flensburg we are good in, um, in startup culture, but we can become even better. Yeah, how do we do it? Because actually, all of our processes, our marketing, and the number of lectures 
isn't orchestrated to the output of startup. These in 18 startups per 100,000 uh, 100, um, residents compared to the 3.1 uh, national average. It's more or less by, not accident really, but um, it's a kind of side, side topic. And the next one is how can we make technology-based startups and entrepreneurship education even more attractive also to uh, women? In Germany, we have um, um, in, in uh, IT-related study programs, we have only f three to five percent women in it. And it's in economic business modernization, it's 50-50, let's say, but in, uh, in IT, not. And so we are interested in um, becoming more attractive for, for women. So um, what's our success plan? I think it's good to, to follow Amazon. The Amazon strategy or way is um, we should know about our strength and bring them customer or student oriented to market, like Amazon is doing. That means um, um, we should be aware that um, simply uh, bringing new traditional study programs into a portfolio or renew our um, traditional programs is not longer a way to survive. Um, universities um, in Germany are competing. Um, we have a decreasing number of young people. Um, the, the population is becoming older and older. We have a lot of private and public universities. They are all uh, fighting for new students for the market, for market share and we are in a competition. Um, it doesn't make sense in a decreasing market to offer the same business, business, business administration program or business information technology program, whereas we have in, in the closer area of more attractive cities. Yeah. So um, we must to learn to act as product manager or strategists in companies. We have to find for market share um, we have to increase it, and there's a paradigm that's called Vasine um, in the age of VUCA or in a VUCA world. Um, we need, it's all about velocity, agility, creativity, innovation. We have to act in networks and we have to experiment. This is also important for us as, as, as universities. So, key questions for every action or our goal as, as a university or as a program manager um, for a study program is. Does it make us faster? Does it make us more agile in market? Do we allow creative ways of solving problems? Do we allow it for students or for us internally to, to manage a study program? Do we support innovation in all areas? Which networks give us the most value or do we foster a culture of experimentation? And if I look with, uh, to a traditional university with a high bureaucracy, um, um, and we have in Germany, we have lecturers, they are um, lifelong, it's a lifelong position. Um, they don't need to be innovative. They will get their money from month to month. They will run their, their topic. Um, um, some of them feel very uncomfortable if they need to change something, like COVID. Oh, I, I, I should need my lecture uh, remote. Oh no, where's my protector? I want to have my old slides, uh, something like that. We, had also, we have also colleagues who are innovative and like to teach in new ways. Uh, so it's, it's difficult. Um, yes, and this, uh, if we ask that key questions um, in a good way, it's possible to become a fluid university. That mean, uh, we, can, we can react very fast and quick to, to market, to, to student needs, to industry needs, and to become also even more attractive to our students. If, if we compare um, teaching a traditional module, we can see that a professor is teaching um, of, of, of a teach of a, uh, the workload for five credit points within one semester is 150 hours. Um, from those 150 hours, a professor is teaching normally 50 hours, one third. Uh, yes. Um, 100. No, the numbers are wrong. 120 hours. Um, a student is um, using 50 to 70 hours for self-learning time, preparation, um, preparing a lecture, preparing knowledge, gaining knowledge, transfer, 
and um, they use run about 30 hours for, uh, press, uh, for exams, for presentations, or for writing a paper. This is a traditional um, um, workload for a module. So uh, it's 70 hours, not 50 um, for students. And a team academic module, uh, we can reduce the teaching time from professors uh, down to 10 hours. Students have also a self-learning time, but students work on their companies, on their projects for also 40 hours. And uh, there's a special part of um, team coaching. So every student will be coached. It is progress in the soft skills area or field as well as um, in the professional area and field. And uh, at the end, they write a project or self-report, a reflection. So um, professors will have um, um, will save around about forty percent of contact time. Um, and within an era, we are talking about oh, we need more resources, we have less money, our market is increasing. We need to be innovative for new content or modules or ways of working. Um, I think this is this is good because we can concentrate also on new uh, stuff and, and innovation. So this um, safe time, these resources can be invested in research, additional research, um, um, start new corporations, um, offer more attractive modules, and whatever. And this means become a fluid university, because it's a win-win for all. Um, how can a roadmap to more excellence look like? Our strength, especially in business information technology, is we have expertise in software engineering and innovation in artificial intelligence and in the existing startup ecosystem. And we are willing to, uh, and we have the capability to innovate. So maybe um, in our short term view, it's always important to innovate the core. That means to innovate our existing traditional study program, kind of redesign, let's say, or design new one. Um, the second stage can be in a short or midterm you bring something new into it, but in a well known area um, close to our existing study programs, services or structures. And stage three can be bringing something totally new into it on a mid long term view. So it's the transformation of being a lecturer of 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 designing a, a study program into something which we may not know yet with a high of, let's say, uncertainty or risk. And um, I think a lot of you know this um, innovation um, model. It's from Harvard Business. So we have a core innovation, adjacent innovation, transformation innovation. They are related to the three stages I've just mentioned before. So um, the core innovation for us could be bringing more artificial intelligence um, degrees into our existing programs, um, like AI engineering, AI infrastructure, or AI algorithms and AI management, because it's attractive for people. Um, but we still have to solve a problem that we need to be attractive for women as well. So maybe combine AI with sustainability or with media or design can be a solution for that. So the second stage or innovation could be built a faculty based internal team academy um, and um, focus on NI on sustainable entrepreneurship or innovation uh, to create startups. Also, um, um, create new cooperation programs in the areas of digital startup business with AI, with student exchange based on the Team Academy approach, um, and to become a member of the Global Team Academy network. And we also need to share our resources and content to reach more flexibility, like um, double degrees. The third and really innovation will be to offer cross-faculty and cross-university team academies. So students can st start their study here. They can go to Flensburg, uh, visit the team academy. We can also go to Spain or wherever. And all of the modules they are, or lectures they attend will be included in their degree later on. Um, and it's become independent from, from existing module handbooks or programs within one single university because we want to um, develop soft skills more than knowledge. And if the students can apply 
the expertise they gained with whichever modules they has has attended. It's okay because they need the knowledge on their own, not because of we decide or we define a study program and a path of learning. Um, a joint startup accelerator that uh, allows uh, to, to enable rapid lean startup experiences and go to market activities and all involved companies would be also created here. As an example, if we have a cooperation between Flensburg and Jamba and students are studying in a team academy approach from both company sites, maybe they can come together to a team, seven and seven, from every nation and they can start their business in Germany as, or Europe as well as in Indonesia. This, is, this will be a very, very huge experience for both of them. It's an intercultural management um, expertise as well as doing the market research, learn uh, from, from the other side and whatever. And if you will set an international company builder on top, which is funded by um, the university, by government, as well as by private companies. And private companies can start cooperation also um, by over the uh, student exchange and team academy. This will be, um, I, I think, a, a very, very great development. And, and the rule model here can be the plug and play techness, tech center. They're originally founded in San Francisco one of the major um, company builder, uh, incubator and accelerator in, in US and worldwide. We also run different uh, centers uh, in Israel, in Germany, in US, in, in some Asian markets, and they have different startup batches and segments, and um, it's working very, very, it could be a rule model for it. So the future ecosystem for, for startup or research-based education, how can it look like? So we have the existing test-up environment I've shown at the beginning of the session with N uh, team academies within this ecosystem um, coming from um, uh, the focus on, let's say, um, product management, engineering, biotechnology, life sciences or whatever. Um, we can use also existing traditional or public funding programs, um, existing corporations with companies, or digital business-related clubs and associations. We have it already. I think you will have it also in your company, more or less. We can build common AI and digital business research center. We can um, uh, deepening the international business cooperation. Uh, we can create double degrees in digital business startup and innovation. Um, we can also um, create borderless and seamless study programs in future. Um, there's a worldwide team academy ecosystem you can join um, and maybe also some international straightforward cooperations in research and education. This will help to, to strengthen all of these startup um, activities. Um, yes, um, this is the international um, team academy network of Mondragon University um, with um, uh, other small team academies like in Germany, Bremerhaven are not mentioned. And I'm sure that um, team academies from other universities are also not mentioned, but it's only the Mondragon University. You will have much more team academies. We are already having team academies in Berlin, in Seoul, in Tokyo, in Singapore, in Shanghai in Nairobi, in a lot of European cities, of course, especially in Spain, because Montalcón University is located in Spain, in Bogota and San Jose. Um, in a perfect world, um, or under perf and, uh, perfect um, circumstances, students are able to visit other team academies whenever they want and can. Yes, so it's also a huge opportunity uh, as if you will run a team academy, students decide, okay, let's let's spend one year in Europe. So we go to the team academies, can work within the ecosystem and the other way around as well. So, yes. But um, back to today, what can we do in the near future? Um, we, can, we can establish a joint exchange of students from computer science and business faculties based on existing programs. It's easy or from other faculties. Um, we can also build uh, joint AI and digital business related study programs to let students work and learn together, maybe also remote. 
it's a, it hits a bit of time difference, but it can be managed, I'm sure. Um, we can exchange knowledge and resources in tourism, in agriculture, maritime or sustainability to start first um, um, education as well as um, um, research corporations. And we can think together about a strategy to establish a fund uh, and fund a German Indonesian digital business startup or AI research center. This is something we can start thinking about or we'll let it work in the near future and um, maybe come to that um, overall picture to say how, how could education and research look like in five to ten years. Yes, that's my um, input, or what was input from my side, some, some ideas, uh, some thoughts about education in future, and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, <coughs> Professor Andreas. Um, before we give everyone to um, uh, write the questions, I'm interested with your slide in um, the, the changing of uh, teaching method from 50% of uh, teaching, and then can you show to I everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, becoming 10%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you show the, um, yeah, share the, the, the slide? Um, I'm already in the sharing mode. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, this one. I've corrected the number. Yeah, 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 in the yeah. Meantime, uh, yeah. No, uh, I hope that uh, we have more lecturers coming to this uh, event yeah, because it is very important. What I am wondering is that if there is a changing of uh, percentage from uh, professor teaching uh, from 50 to 10, and then we move, uh, we give 40 percent student self-learning time and also student student working on project this is what we actually have done but i think it is mislead because now um, most student if uh, they have a very uh, heavy work homework and then i think it doesn't mean that it is a uh, self-learning time and working on projects because they will miss something that they really need for example like uh, in in europe perhaps Professor Andres knows that uh, most uh, students, they will have part-time job. This is uh, what we don't have here. So for student, when they have uh, student, student self-learning time and working on project, they do not have time to be in uh, business companies, something like that. Because they only yeah, write papers and then hand into the lecturer, write paper again, hand into the lecturer. I think it doesn't write. It is not right. So, um, how can we? Uh, perhaps you can uh, give an example uh, in in your university or maybe in Europe. How then uh, university can create a management of learning from uh, their student? They get input and knowledge from professor, and then they are ready to work in the companies. This is something what I'm thinking of. Thank you. Um, maybe if I can add yes, something. Yes, please. Uh, probably it's the, uh, it's different in, in Europe and in Indonesia. In Indonesia, we have lots of small uh, credits. So for example, in one semester, we have uh, 12 uh, modules for the students. So like each of them have two credits. So probably it is different in, in Germany, so. Yes, typically we have um, five to six credits. Sometimes we have modules um, where you, uh, we run over two semesters with 10 to 12 credits. So it depends. Um, we have six modules run about. Uh, yeah. So in, in this university, typically we have 12 modules. 12 modules. Yeah, we have 12 modules. So like we have twice. Yeah, but, yes, in, in your traditional. From your traditional point of view, yes, you will have 12 modules, oh, but it not, but it don't need to be 12 as long as, as if you save a new program with another module structure, it, it is making sense. Yeah, so it depends. Um, yes, um, um, in, in, in Germany, I think in Europe, um, most of students are working um, at least 25, 20 to 25 hours a week beside their study program. Um, it's also 
challenging them because they need to fulfill that 450 hours per module um, learning time per semester. And um, but for Team Academy, it's it's another approach because first students will apply in a special way. They have to write a motivation letter. We will get. Um, they, they, they will be usually a professor or a program manager will call them and tell them, "Hey, um, what's your expectation about?" I will tell you how the study program looks like. And please think about if the study program meets your expectations because it's a, it's a very special program. Um, you do, need to be self-organized. Um, um, and if they apply, um, they are working on their own business. That means they don't, usually they don't have the time to work aside in a company, but I think it's not it's impossible to do it, it needs more time. Um, in professor teaching means um, every, you also have modules in team academies, let's say module marketing, yeah? But um, if a team decides for itself, um, we have a startup for in business to business, and another team is running, uh, a, let's say a fashion startup or something in the beauty area, um, one team needs more knowledge in social media marketing, when other, while other teams need knowledge in business to business marketing. Or if a team decides they want to sell products on Amazon Marketplace, it's marketplace marketing. Yeah. So within the module marketing, each team decides by itself which knowledge they want to gain. Um, a professor or a module is designed by giving some borders, right, or left and right. Um, and the rest is managed by the team. At the end, um, in the project or self-report or during the coaching sessions, the professor tries to ensure that, okay, which, what kind of literature have you have to read to, to your marketing needs? Um, was it good literature? How does it apply to your project? How did you manage your project? Um, this is something which goes into the mark um, goes into the project report and uh, the self-report is about how did this have an influence to my soft skills, um, to my point of view. Yeah. Um, also, one, one very, very important thing in team academies are the coaching sessions. You need psychologists because you have team dynamics, people have their own personalities. Um, sometimes team members are crashing against each other, they argue, and it's personally development, so you need to manage it as well. This is also, you need at least two or three um, coaches within your team, and uh, they are also uh, support professors, and this sets time free. So uh, two different approaches, um, uh, and you need to be aware of it. Does it mean if uh, we apply um, the team academy module 10 plus 40 uh, compared with the 50 professor teaching, does it mean that your students still have time to uh, work as a part-time job in the in Europe? Uh, or in, less in, likely, or? Yeah, it depends. In total, they have also 150 hours. Uh, it's, so the, the number of hours doesn't increase. So they have the same time yeah. by design, and they also have uh, theoretically they have time to to work aside on other things. But but if you if you're really really addicted to your startup, if you make first revenues with your startup, if you have first customers, students are not willing to work in another company because they want to work for their own startup. And um, experience shows that um, colleagues uh, of me. Uh, having problems to push their students to a degree because they say, hey, why should I study? I have a business. Yeah, I don't have time to, to finish my study. I want to do business. And you have to manage it as well. Okay, thank you very much for the explanation. Lors, please speak up. <laughs> uh, any question, please? can use Bahasa Indonesia, Mbak Fitri will translate. Yeah, you are my secretary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please, this is about 
start startup, this is about creativity. Come on, be creative. <laughs> yeah. I know that you want to. Uh, I know that you want to ask something. Uh, thank you for the opportunity that has been given to me. Uh, previously, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Yuma Malishabana from the agri business study program, Faculty of Agriculture, University of Limber. Uh, at this time, I want to ask a question for us, how we can develop startup and uh, bagaimana caranya kita mengembangkan pendidikan teruta, uh, startup terutama di bidang pendidikan, uh, karena terutama saya sendiri sangat senang sekali di dunia teaching Mostly, I very like in the teaching world, and I want to develop the human resource. How to make a new generation that have good skill and apa uh, output dari kuliah itu adalah bisa didapatkan dengan sangat baik. Jadi, bagaimana caranya saya bisa mengembangkan itu dengan sangat baik, terutama saya sangat seka, senang sekali dengan dunia pendidikan dan sudah menjadi impian saya. My dream is I want to be a lecturer. I want to develop the student how to be a good student. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It was Please, in, uh, in uh, English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get a question. Okay. So uh, like he has the question like how we can build a startup um, like in education like uh, to the startup. Okay, I need to answer in a more general way because it's um, it's it's a, a general question. Um, uh, first, I think you need you you need to know about a problem you will solve. Uh, let's say a, a consumer customer need. As as you start up solving the need of um, um, simple simple easy getting simple easy fairy tales. Um, along maybe to your company, to country's culture, and offering also additional services like uh, those AI parts. Um, you, you know, you know, um, the, the the most important points about the problem of your possible or potential customers. There are some different techniques to 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 reach that. That means design thinking um, could be could be one one methodology and when you go into an idea brainstorming and you will you will create ideas the most promising one ideas um, you have to prioritize and you should set focus on during this process every time you will ask potential customers or users how uh, if if they fit to your needs you will get, you will collect feedback and after it you will it's important to create a business model a business model which helps you to um, to run your business on market. So same like here, if if you offer sensoric um, and your margin is very low, I'm sure you won't survive a very long on market um, because um, you you will you will not earn enough money for create more innovations for for hiring experts and and whatever. Um, so your business model. Should, should also allow um, to survive and you, you need to, to, to answer um, elementary questions like um, um, how does the right pricing model looks like, um, what are my important costs, does it cover all of my um, activities and whatever. So um, there are different methodologies you, you need to, to go through and um, um, you have to follow them also there's also topic like lean startup you can you can validate your id very very fast and um, you, you can build prototypes uh, to show to show your product to, to to let your consumers customers or users get a feeling about your solution you will collect feedback as well and you can ask them okay how much you are willing to pay for it um, or you can ask companies how much they are willing to pay to serve it to their customers um, so it depends who is your customer. Is it a company uh, as a multiplier, or is it as, uh, you as a company to, to consumers? To, to, um, so it depends. A lot of questions which need to be asked. But you you have to follow a methodology, and 
you have to go in a very structured but agile way to do it. Uh, thank you very much. I think we have one. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 please uh, translate. <laughs> Uh, jadi tadi kan pertanyaannya ini ya bagaimana membuat startup di bidang pendidikan ya yang pertama yang harus diketahui itu um, problemnya apa terus mau menawarkan solusi apa seperti dicontohkan tadi yang punya saya problemnya kan itu ya tidak ada apa belum ada uh, apa namanya uh, materi bahasa Inggris yang berbasis culture gitu ya nah seperti itu terus kemudian harus tahu customernya dulu nanti membuat prototype terus ditawarkan gitu jadi kira-kira ini dihargai berapa nah kemudian ya, seperti itu ya Okay, thank you for the translation. <laughs> uh, this university has uh, become new public service body, which means that uh, starting from this year, the University of Jember uh, has authority to create their own business to get uh, revenue. So one of the committees is now here in Mass. Uh, sorry, I don't want to call your name, uh, but it is wrong. So uh, he is one of the member of the task force team. So perhaps if uh, you have question, please. So Professor Andreas and. Terima kasih, Mas ya. Firstly, I want to introduce myself. My name is Hidayat. Usually, my friend called me Nuhi. Yeah? An acronym from my full name Nurul Hidayat. Uh, hopefully, Mbak Pitri can understand yeah, because I'm uh, I was an ex student of her uh, English course institution. Thank you, Mr. Andre, for coming to our, our university. Uh, yes, it is true that by February 2023, uh, our rector find me as one of what is BPU ya yeah? we call it BPU badan pengembang usaha it, it is kind of a institution to encourage uh, all of our subsystem in university to involve in revenue generating activities ya yeah? uh, moving from uh, academic typical university into Entrepreneur University, yeah. Uh, our leaders encourage us to generate much more uh, what is entrepreneurial unit to generate more income for our universities. As a consequence, uh, as a consequence for new status BLU, yeah. My question may be, um, how to start? moving from academic university into more little bit business university not for a commercial uh, not for commercial goals but at least for our financial independence uh, in order not to more uh, but uh, dependent to our national national fund something like that yeah hope hopefully master Andrea can understand what I mean. Mbak Fitri mungkin bisa translasi kalau bahasa saya agak seperti hantu hari ini ya. Uh, yes, something like that ya. That's my question. Maybe can be uh, berkembang ya. Uh, it is a very long time I don't join uh, English discussion version like this. So for you for, sorry for uh, the diction and some misinterpretation. Thank you. I, I think I got, I, I got a question. Um, yes, it, it depends. Um, um, in, in Germany, um, I think also in, in a lot of other European countries, uh, countries uh, you can see um, institutes which are partly public and partly private funded, like Fraunhofer. Yeah? where we apply for 
for public fundings as well as by doing research for, for enterprises uh, and, uh, and offering services. So we, they will earn their money also from private sector as well. Um, I know some universities are offering special education um, courses for, for adult education, um, for um, offering management lectures for to companies, employees, to trainees, or um, as a kind of, um, let's say, if companies offer their talents, special programs or services to develop themselves, soft skills or, or, or hard skills, and they earn money with it. It's a kind of summer, summer academy, we call it. Um, these are entities, um, um, private, mostly private managed but they belong to a university and, and professors um, will spend their time during let's say summer holidays or winter holidays and offering additional modules and they can earn additional money um, it's it's a kind of profit center um, they create products and and sell it often it's a content of a module from a master lecture um, but we try to bring the managers or executives together, and uh, it's it's a, a, a block model. Um, you need to think uh, more and more more in this way. You can also create, a, let's say, a, a startup environment. Um, you you can try to enable startup funding um, together with with private business angels and VCs. You, you can host that, let's say, uh, company builder program or, or incubator program. And um, every startup which will be run through your program, um, you, will, you, will, you will take shares of it. And um, with the valuation of the startup, um, you will also, your, your, the valuation or the, your assets will be, will be increasing or will be decreasing, depends. Yeah. Um, you need to think about in different creative ways. Um, which which models or combinations uh, your ecosystem um, or your regulations are allowing or not? Um, we have a lot of industry uh, in Europe. Um, they there's a, a lot of money, let's say, um, um, which which can be addressed. Um, but we have also a lot of competition, of course. Um, from the, from the, with different universities and research institutes. Maybe um, your situation, um, your structure is a bit another one because maybe you have, um, even if you have 280 billion, million um, residents in, uh, or population, you have, let's say, less four to five or six big universities. Maybe you have a broader small and medium-sized com uh, company, um, number of companies as in Germany, but we also know it's called the Mittelstand. We have also SMEs and it's the backbone of our economy. So we have also a lot of SMEs. You need to create special services to them. Professional services, education services and um, programs um, to, to develop the hard and soft skills of of leaders from them, and um, you can earn money with it. Uh, it depends. So there's no clear answer. You need to be creative, and you have to look for other best practices in other, maybe, countries with same situation, with same structure, but also look to countries where are very well developed in a high competitive market. Look to tech centers in Israel or, or in Singapore. Um, how they manage it. Um, maybe the, you can also look for patterns like um, uh, Dubai or the Arabic countries. They have a lot of um, resources like like oil, but and tourism, but not, not not other things. And how do they will address the change in um, uh, in oil uh, decreasing oil demand because um, uh, all of them is going to electricity cars and whatever. How do they manage a uh, change um, and new ways of funding? Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't directly apply to university and your situation, but you can look for patterns behind it. Does it answer your question? Yeah, can I have one more question? Yeah, please. Okay. 
I think my second question is much more will be focus on certain areas. Yeah. Uh, we already know in nationally or globally the economic world going to decrease for some reasons. Uh, it's going to be harder and harder for the next months and years uh, to create any uh, economic activities, especially institutional base. Uh, we know there are two separated arenas here, uh, externally and internally. Yeah? Before we are facing the difficulties in uh, national economic uh, competition, I think, I think in my own opinion is we need to make a good preparation internally. So this is our challenge now. As, a, uh, as an institution, yeah, big institution, we have 15 faculties, yeah? faculties within 100 uh, jurusan, yeah? a department, yeah? department. So how to consolidate and uh, moving from academic habit into a business mindset habit? This is uh, what we have uh, early challenge or, or the closest challenge now. We already in uh, 20 years earlier, our habit is more purely academic, writing, researching, discussing and something like that. But start from this year, we need to combine our academic skill and economic skill. Mm. This is our challenge internally. How to start to make a new habit from purely academic uh, mindset into what is called business mindset. Mm. Yeah. But both culturally and institutionally because we have a large number of sub institution here. Mm. We have 15 faculties, we have uh, more than 10 institutional, extended institutional, and hundreds of uh, laboratorium and department. So this is our challenge. How to consolidate all that big family into one direction to be more productive economically university. Kira-kira gitu Mbak Fitri. Yeah. Mana? <laughs> I, let me, I, um, yeah, let me, let me let me build an analogy in, in 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 i think in a lot of companies you have let's say or or even hospitals you have two kind of executives top executives you have one economic ceo let's say and you have a technical director or, or medicine director um, if i would be um the the ministry for education or if I would be the rector of a university or president of a university, I would bring a second top leading rule into it. This person is coming from, from economy as a top manager, let's say, and this should be a top manager in, in sales. Yeah. Uh, he can, of course, he can earn much more money than me if, if his salary is performance-based, because as more money he brings into my organization, as better as it is for my organization. So a lot of people struggling because of sales managers uh, earning much more than a CEO, but uh, they should, they are good. Right? Um, if you have this top position, um, which is a person with a network, who is going out and knew how to find sources of revenue. And he's having also a good staff team who is able to manage and develop products. Yeah? And the staff team needs to orchestrate and to manage all of the different faculties yeah? and uh, along programs that make sense or products and try to bring um, selected people from them together to serve whatever service or product is possible. That makes sense. It's a kind of investment. Um, but you, it's, it, I think it won't work if you give those tasks to existing lecturers or existing staff because they are not used to be um, salesmen. They are not used to develop products which needs to exist on market. They are used to to teach students, educate students, where you're used to do research, where you're used to manage an administration or university, but 
they are not used to be managers and, and sellers and do marketing. It won't work, I'm sure it won't work. If you have an entity, let's say a small sized separate company, a structured model, and all of those people are from managers and, um, and, and experts in creating products, sell products, and they know how to handle and how to talk with faculty members to, to create a service. This will work, but no other way, I think. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Uh, is it becoming clearer or more confused? <laughs> In between. <laughs> In between, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no worries. We um, have a very long time to settle, uh, settle and set up uh, this university become ready to uh, uh, jump into the business area. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Professor Andreas, Mbak Fitri, Mas Tata. Tama. Tama, Mas Tama. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, actually, if we still have more questions, please. Uh, I don't, um, if you don't mind, uh, perhaps uh, everyone can uh, discuss informally after this session because we have to end up this session. We already uh, run 50, uh, 20 minutes after the, uh, after the two. So thank you very much everyone for coming to this uh, session. Uh, I have to end this session by saying thank you very much and see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye, thank you. Thank you, Pak Hanif. Dear ladies and gentlemen, before we end this program, we would like to invite the Secretary 3 of Center for Research. Sorry. Before we end this program, we would like to invite the Secretary 3 of Center for Research and Society Engagement University of Jember, Muhammad Rondi, MP, PhD, to give the closing remark. So, Pak Rondi, time is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, MC. Uh, today we have, we already have two hour uh, interesting uh, discussion. So thank you for Professor Andreas, uh, the first time for to see you, but uh, hopefully next time we can uh, have a close relationship. And then also uh, for Bufitri for interesting presentation, uh, inspiring for uh, student and also lecturer in University of Jember and also Mr. Tama uh, for uh, research finding to be a startup in early warning system. Uh, we have already discussion about the uh, how to improve our university spirit uh, to be entrepreneur university same thing like, like this uh, maybe next time we will have a uh, close relationship between uh, university of Zimbabwe and also university of Flinsburg also to improve our uh, uh, skill especially for uh, student also for alumni or also for uh, lecture uh, uh, we hope that this is not the first time and the, the end time, but uh, this is the start time to have a close relationship. Uh, belong to this uh, institution, uh, research and uh, community empowerment. Uh, we say the many, many thanks for uh, today's discussion and uh, also for student also coming uh, coming here uh, both in uh, online or also off, uh, offline uh, this is the end of this session thank you very much and hopefully we can have 
uh, have next discussion. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pak Rondi, for the speech. All blessed audiences, now we have come to the end of this program. The committee would like to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation to all the speakers, the moderator, as well as the participants joining fully. Finally, the committee would like to deliver apology for any inconvenience, and we hope to meet you again in our next agenda. Thank you and have a nice day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, thank you very much, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.